policeman. What crimes did you see the aftermath of that were so cool that you didn't want to arrest the criminal? Tale of an old boyfriend's misspent youth, sticking it to the man, and in the process, gaining the grudging respect and admiration of the Baconator who busted him. I'm not a cop, but I have a cool story about an ex-boyfriend and his crazy cop-criminal camaraderie. I talked about it many times before on here, but most of those posts are now years old and buried under giant slabs of blather. He is brilliant, but super messed up. When he was in his early 20s, he got into illegal substances. He ended up homeless, dumpster diving for food and saleable items, whatever. One day, he found a set of lock picks in a little leather case. He immediately hit up the library and threw books and the library's free computers and internet, set about teaching himself to pick locks. The thing about ICE is it makes you incredibly single-minded, but this dude was also the type where if he became interested in something, he dove deep into full-on obsession. He started spending all his time with locks, then he started making keys. I don't know how many of you have had experience hanging around in those types of dens, but he was the guy in the corner bent over a Dremel for two days straight. Soon, no lock could keep him out. He still had his morals somewhat intact at this point, so armed with this new skill, he decided to go after parking meters. He figured that because paid parking was instituted in World War II to pay for the war effort, then never taken offline as promised by various governments, he was stealing from the man. He soon branched out to vending machines and coin-operated laundry machines too, though that was later. He would somehow steal a parking meter, either by bashing it over with a crappy car, then tossing it into the trunk and speeding off, or painstakingly hacksawing the metal pole. Some meters were just locked to the pole, so he would just pick that lock and make off with the head. He would then abscond with his prize to a secluded location, usually a flop house, and set about copying the keyway. Because the meters in our town at the time only had three or four master keys, he soon had homemade keys to every meter in the city. It was then as simple as rolling up to each meter on the street, opening it, pulling out the cup of change, dumping it into a heavy-duty duffel bag, putting it all back the way he found it, and moving on to the next. He was pulling in three or four grand every time he went out. He targeted private paid parking lots too, because to him, they were the worst of the worst. Those were the mother load because they had larger coins and bills in them. He soon became very popular. He would pay people to spot, block sight lines, and drive him around, and word got out. He was a man, because when you have several thousand dollars every night, you're the life of the party. With this quote-unquote positive attention came the negative, however. One story that comes to mind, there was this up-and-coming kingpin called the Fat Persian, nationality change for privacy reasons, from whom my ex scored often from. TFP was delighted with the way EBF, XBF, was Robin Hooding around, sticking into the men and pulling in fat wads. Dollar signs flashed in my eyes, or cent signs anyway, so TFP came up with a plan. This particular night finds EBF at a flop house holding court in the corner with his trusty Dremel. Someone hands him a phone. On the other end is the urgent Soto voice of a girl he knows, a girl who hung out at TFP's place a lot. Get the hell out of there right now. They're on their way for you. You maybe have five minutes. Go. Before EBF could ask any questions, she had already hung up. He handed back the phone, stuffed his crap into his backpack, quietly deked out the back door and ran through backyards to get as far away as fast as possible. 4.8 minutes later, the doors kicked in and men with balaclavas and various weapons stormed the place. It was a multi-level house stuffed with people in various stages of tweaking and nodding, so it took a while to get everyone on the floor in one room and realize that EBF was nowhere to be found. Where the hell is he? We don't know. He was just here minutes ago. Check. This closet, that bathroom, that bedroom, the back shed, etc., etc. Their plan foiled. The EBF's would-be killers and assailants broke some stuff, hit a few terrified bystanders, and left. The plan was to abscond with the brain, take him to some dank basement, handcuff him to a radiator or what have you, shoot him up with speed 24-7, and force him to make keys until he could function no longer. Then, who knows? Dispose of him in some grisly fashion, most likely. Later, when confronted over the phone IRRC, TFP was like, Come on, buddy, you can't blame a guy for trying, can you? Ha ha ha. No hard feelings, eh? I digress. Crap was getting real. The cops, the city, and the private parking companies were also doing the math and realizing that someone was ferreting into their Dodge receptacles and getting away clean. After numerous arrests, near misses, and run-ins, the Baconators knew who their guy was. It was just a matter of catching him red-handed. 
The owner of one of the main monopolist private parking companies began staking out his own properties. He parked in his lots overnight to every night for a month, waiting and watching. He always managed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He'd be in one lot whilst EBF was in another across town, monkeying with his stuff, etc., etc. Finally, parking dude caught and apprehended EBF with his hand in the change jar, called the cops and crowd with the light. Then he probably slept the best sleep of his life or at least since EBF began his reign of terror. Parking dude couldn't deny the ingenuity and straight-up wiliness displayed by EBF, though, and had to hand it to the guy. Same with the cops. One cop in particular, the guy EBF had the most dealings with, was also gleefully flabbergasted by the nuts on this kid. In the interrogation room, you'd sworn the two were old buddies laughing over beers, reminiscing about the good old days. So that night we were chasing you and you disappeared, where the hell did you go? We were totally stymied, it's like you teleported away. Well, you know that bush beside the house on street and venue? I hid in there until you guys left. No way, we must have walked past that damn bush 20 times. <laughs> yeah, I was ducking in my Batman underoos for sure. Oh, check this out. This was the meeting I was at a few weeks ago with the mayor, chief of police, and parking commissioner. Mayor, what are we going to do about this kid with the keys? Parking commish, well, we've already changed the locks on 30% of the meters. Police chief pulls out a ring with a bunch of janky homemade keys on it, selects a key, and holds it up. You mean these locks? Parking commish, oh, well, we have introduced a new virtually pick-proof lock in a few meters. We've only managed to install it on a few meters, but... Police commissioner, picks another key from the ring and holds it up, eyebrows cocked. Parking commissioner, ah, I see, well, there is another option. Police commissioner, selects another three keys from the ring and fans them out. Are you going to tell us about these now? Unbreachable locks now? Mayor and parking commissioner in unison. Crap! Mayor, are you guys going to get this guy or what? It was priceless. We were so pissed off, we were all certain the parking commissioner was going to get fired along with the rest of us. <laughs> That's so awesome. They ended up becoming friends, especially after EBF got out of the last longest stretch of jail during that time and decided to straighten up. When EBF got out, parking dude tracked him down and hired him as a security consultant. When that gig ended, he hired him on as a meter reader. That job was too hard for him to do from a moral perspective, though. Suddenly, he was working for the man, doing his bidding, and the cognitive dissonance was just too much. He stayed clean for eight years and regularly met up with a cop for beers or coffee, and they always had a ball reminiscing about the good old, bad old days. This was around the time he and I reconnected. We were street urchins together in our early teens, or my early teens and his late ones. He was four years older than me. We got together, I cleaned up from my substance of choice, and we had a few happy years before crap started going sideways. He's not doing well at all these days, but I've managed to stay clean for five years as of yesterday. That's another story, though, and also somewhere far back in my post-history. Let's just say things got spectacularly terrible for both of us. I hope you enjoyed my secondhand, not a cop, but story. Story 2. I had a case in my first year as an officer where a buzzed man launched his car off a boat ramp. We approximated that he was going about 50 miles per hour and the car landed in 20 feet of water. Now, the cool part, he swam out, ran 8 miles to his uncle's house and stole his tow truck. He then drove the truck back, swam down and hooked the tow cable to the axle of the car and then proceeded to pull the tow truck into the water as well. We were called on scene and we could only see the headlights and the tip of the hood above water. He was passed out asleep on the dock next to it. I don't know why, but this feels like something a Scott or Florida man would do. Amazing levels of stubbornness here, though. Story 3. This one always gets to me. In my city, a homeless man was breaking into homes by lockpicking. Nothing unusual with that. However, what he did was brilliant. He would wait until he knew the times people wouldn't be home and would clean their homes for them. He averaged a week or so per home going unnoticed. The first few homes he was never caught, but signs of a home invasion were reported to us. On the house he did get caught in, he used the defense that he was cleaning a home that he was hired to clean and mistakenly got the house wrong and the door was left open. Armed with nothing but a cell phone, he made fake email correspondence to back his claims from a client with a similar address. He was able to overall, unproven but speculated, stay for upwards of a month in homes. In court, his defense was actually successful, IMO, because the other cases he couldn't be linked to and was only prosecuted for the one. Then with his defense, his lawyer only got him 14 days in jail. 
Guy never took anything outside of food. He would clean their house, eat, shower, and nap, and then leave. All right, so I was quoted $90 an hour recently for home cleaning. House cleaning for the price of a pizza? Let's do it. Now, if you want to sign up for this guy's services, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. It really helps me out. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the stories. Story four. I have two. First, my uncle is a cop in Philly. They arrested a guy who, in one night, put up a 20-foot-long, 10-foot-high mosaic mural. Second, my friend is a police officer in Berlin. He and his colleague were sent to an incident of DV. A guy was roughing up his wife, and the neighbors called the police. When they arrived at the scene, they found the son of the wife roughing up his stepfather, who was trying to fight back but just catched one hit after the other. The son made sure not to hit his stepfather's face, and when asked later, he said, I didn't want him to drop unconscious, I wanted this to last. Also, that would have been unfair as he never hit my mother where other people could see her bruises too. Alright, so I read, catched one hit after the other, and at first thought it was catching their punches with his hands like a martial arts block, Bruce Lee style, you know? But if anything, good on that kid for doing that to his stepfather. He deserved it. Story 5 I'm not a cop, but I've been let go by the cops a number of times when I was a wild youth. First, there were many times I just walked calmly past the cops busting a house party. They were too busy having fun chasing the kids running or hiding. Another time, I was out joyriding with my friends soon after the 4th of July. We were in a rural area and had some fireworks in the car. We hadn't seen a car for miles, so I had the brilliant idea for Roman candle jousting. I held the candle outside and shot out above and in front of the car so we would drive through the sparks. It was great watching all the colorful bursts shower over the windshield. We did two candles and decided we would do one more and be done. The last candle, we passed a dark car on the side of the road for the last round of sparks. Quickly, we realized that the car was following us fast, so my friend put the pedal down to get away. I think we got up to 70 before the cop lights came on and we realized we were doomed. We pulled over immediately, of course. In the end, the cops confiscated our fireworks and told us we would be receiving several fines in the mail. Those fines never came, though. Story 6. Not a cop here, but I think this is worthy of posting. I used to work for a high-end designer brand in a tourist area. The jeans were worth about $300 each. The store was on the first floor next door to another store, which was under vacant and renovation. One morning, I came in to open the store and walked into the stockroom, and right as I walked in, I noticed there was a 4x4 four four foot hole in the wall. It took me a second to realize about half of the stockroom was empty. By my calculations, I would say at least 50 grand worth of jeans, shirts, and accessories were stolen from that stockroom. I have to give it to them. They knew exactly where to cut through the drywall without hitting any plumbing, gas, or electrical wires. And they got in and out clean. I am pretty sure they were never caught. For a while, I had the feeling that it might have been an inside job. Anyway, that store closed down a few months later, pretty much the craziest heist I've ever had the chance to witness. Though I did see two guys steal some machinery by horse-drawn carriage in South America. Pretty sure they got away, too. LOL. Story 7. Not the cop, but the guy he let go. Was flying down a notoriously steep hill on neighborhood streets on my bicycle. Had the wind at my back and a huge smile on my face as I blew through a stop sign near the bottom. Cop goes flying by, all lit up, sirens blaring, runs up the road, a ways full blast, clear streets, flips everything off and pulls over to wait for me. Waved me over when I got up to him. Did you just blow through a stop sign up there? Yeah, sorry man. Crap, I was looking for a Porsche or something. Do you know how fast you were going? I know how much fun I was having. I tried a goofy smile. 64 miles per hour is nearly triple the speed limit. Shakes head. That's so reckless. Starts to lecture me on fines, penalties, insurance. Hell, a judge might even impose jail time. Thinks for a minute, then continues, You could have killed someone. Pauses a bit, grins almost imperceptibly. My record on that hill is 57. Went from almost pissing myself to relief in a single heartbeat. I got a pretty good run out at the top and I think the wind is at my back today. Next time, stop at the intersection. Gets in the car, drives away. I always do. Now. Damn, my cousin's best on a bicycle was maybe 40 miles per hour, and that scared the hell out of him. Story 8. When I was 14, I smoked because I was such a baddie, you know? Figured my mom didn't know because teenagers are so sneaky. My mom was dating a cop, and on date night, she left and jokingly said, no smoking in the house. Well, a few hours later, I went to the apartment quad for a smoke, and my mom and police boyfriend came home early. She yells, are you smoking? 
And I was a little witch. I was like, yeah, you said don't do it in the house. Her boyfriend was like, technically speaking, he has your parental permission to smoke as long as it wasn't inside. So I don't even need to do anything. We did eventually have a talk about the dangers of smoking and blah, 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 which totally didn't take because I was eventually detained by campus police at 16 for smoking on campus during school hours. Got 30 hours of community service. Story 9. I was not the cop in that situation. I just left a girlfriend of mine in her hometown about 12 a.m. I was going to visit another girlfriend of mine who just came back from the holidays. I took the car and grabbed some beer to drink later. Just before the entrance of her house, a couple of policemen made me stop for a check. At that time, I was tired, I drank a bit, and I didn't remember if I had all the documents with me. The first policeman, a young guy with a serious face, came to me and started to ask questions about the beers on my car. The second man, an old cop with a kind face, was checking out my documents. The young cop asks, where did you come from? And I tell him I went to spend time with a friend of mine. Then he asks where I was going and I tell him I was going to another friend's house to spend some good time. At that point, the old man told the young cop, let him go, he's not drunk, but most probably tired and he will be even more tired with the other friend. They let me go for a magic misunderstanding and the old man also told me I was a good and lucky guy. Story 10. Not a cop, but it is a cool story. In my teenage years, I was a destructive hellion. I just built my first potato cannon. I'm pumped about firing one off, so I run outside to test it. I aim it fairly straight in the air and boom, I look down the street and see this man pop out from around the fence. He was a known kitty fiddler and had been busted for it a decade before we moved into our house. So I see him, I see the potato, I look at him, I look at the potato, oh god, it goes on in his direction and then hits him square in the shoulder, odds. I freak out and run into my house, like an idiot changing my shirt thinking I won't be recognized. 15 minutes later, knock on my door, female police officer there and wants my side of the story. She goes to talk to him again, then comes back. This time she has him with her, he is about 6 foot 8, 350 pounds. I'm freaking out internally at this point. She tells me that I just have to apologize. I tell him sorry, he walks off. And the cool part, after he leaves, she tells me nice shot, don't do it again, and let me keep my potato cannon. Potatoes of justice, all right. Story 11. I was doing graffiti tags in a train carriage. I thought it was empty, and an out-of-nowhere passenger confronted me. He was past 40, not in good shape, nerdy, and stubborn. He was also a major a-hole and getting aggressive even though he was clearly not going to win a fight. He just looked like he hated his life. I felt too bad to intimidate him and knew he wasn't going to listen to my BS excuses. I just apologized and sat down. When I got off at my station, he cheap shot punched me from behind and attempted to tackle me. I ended up having him by the throat with his back against the wall, just holding him away from me. Security saw it all. They tackled me because I was much bigger, but they detained us both. He was just a jerk. He spoke to security like they were a lower human. Either because they were black or because they were minimum wage, I don't know. They picked up on him being an a-hole and weren't buying it. He accused me of doing graffiti and they got joy out of telling him that they didn't see me do anything and it's not illegal to have art supplies. Then he accused me of trying to mug him. They knew he was BSing. I was a good looking middle class kid with no weapons. They ended up calling the cops to arrest him for assaulting a passenger. I explained that I wanted to be long gone before cops were present and they let me go. He was furious. We all had a good laugh at his expense. I didn't press charges. I doubt the Metro did. He probably had to pay a fine. I saw him a few times on the train after that. That grumpy jerk never smiled back. P.S. I know graffiti is an a-hole move. It is what it is. I was and still am an antisocial dummy. Alright, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and if you made it this far, I'm sure you're also going to enjoy Police Officers. What are your best pullover stories? Story 3 was madly insane. I'll see you in that video, and thank you for watching this one.